Croeso Canes, a warm welcome, um, Falta, uh, to this, the fourth session um, of Pererin Oiv is Olith Triach May, I am a pilgrim. Um, this is a uh, participatory arts project um, that is part of the Ancient Connections project that is linking Pembrokeshire and Wexford um, and is uh, exploring, well, trying to create links um, with the Welsh and Irish diaspora for, diaspora of um, Pembrokeshire and Wexford, um, and also exploring the idea of uh, pilgrimage and trying to answer the question, am I a pilgrim? And uh, we've been doing this, uh, taking inspiration from, a, from an, an old Welsh hymn that is called Pererin Oiv, so that is where the project gets its title from. And Pererin Oiv means I am a pilgrim. So um, tonight's session, we have a, a talk from Pamela Petro, uh, who is a, an author um, and artist who's based in Massachusetts, um, uh, but has written about Wales and um, has her own relationship with this place and the places of um, a new pilgrimage route that is being created between St David's and um, Ferns in Wexford. Um, so th this uh, this project is a, is taking the form of a series of seminars, but we're also through exploring the hymn Pereira in Awe, you've have been asking people to um, to pin uh, themselves singing that song or a version of that song to to an online map. So there are two strands to the project activity. There, these sem seminars with people's uh, different expertise around um, uh, the themes of the project uh, and also, um, yeah, this this idea of singing the song or any song that uh, that might call you back home. So I, before I give Pamela her sort of full introduction, I'd like to, um, it just, well, it happens that somebody has shared a song with the map uh, this week, and I would like to, to play this song to start with. Um, uh, at the last session, um, the hymn Pererin Oiv is often sung or has been sung more recently to the tune Amazing Grace, but at the last session seminar we learnt about another tune that this hymn has been sung to um, and would have been sung to a century before and that tune actually goes by the name of Hiraith which is something that Pamela is going to speak how appropriate about later as well so um, I'm just going to share my screen and um, this has been sent in by Paul Evans, who isn't here tonight, but has been at um, some of the past sessions. <laughs> so, what seems like a lifetime ago, my grandparents, George and Mary John, used to bring me and my brother to Panta Dion, a derelict farmstead in the moorlands between Manachlogli and Crumich. It was the home of his grandparents, Rhys and Eleanor John, and the birthplace in 1873 of their firstborn, Grandpa's father and our great-grandfather, Benjamin John. Long after their deaths, it's a pilgrimage I still make to keep that five-generation connection alive, and it's in the hope that my own grandchildren, the seventh generation, will wish to continue. And Croydro ma a thraw. A gun rew this goil bob a rawr. For what even had gerthaw. So this is it. This is the inside of what's left of Panted Dion where my great-grandfather, Benjamin John, was born. His parents started their married life here. And where my grandfather, Benjamin's son, George John, used to bring me and my brother as kids.
kids. We didn't really know the significance of it. It's only recently I've actually found it again and realized what it is, where it is, and why Grandpa brought us here. And that's to reconnect with the family roots and the area. And now I treat this place as my own little pilgrimage whenever I'm in Pembrokeshire. I come up here just to connect with my roots. Um, and hopefully my grandchildren will connect to their grandfather's roots and their great-great-grandfather's roots and their great times five grandparents' roots. So, um, that was great. Lovely. That was really well lovely. That was fantastic. So, yeah, thank, thanks to Paul for sharing that. Um, uh, I sort of thought it made an interesting introduction to, to, to Pamela as well, in that obviously the tune hit Ith, but this, um, Paul talking about a, a, a connection to a place is very much to do with a, a sort of ancestral understanding of that place. Um, but pa Pamela, it comes to Wales it, or came to Wales first in in a way uh, not connected to that place by uh, by any ancestral um, link, um, and yeah, but still has found a strong connection um, with with Wales and and it has become uh yeah just a, a massive part of her life and work so I'm just going to read an introduction to Pamela Pamela Petro is an author artist and educator living in Northampton Massachusetts with her partner Marguerite and Pembroke Welsh Corgi Topaz she has written four books of creative non-fiction including her latest The Long Field Wales and the Presence of Absence a memoir as well as travels in an old tongue, also about Wales. Sitting up with the dead about the American South and the slow breath of stone about Southwest France. Her articles and essays have appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Granta, Guernica, The Paris Review and others. And this year she was shortlisted for the 2022 Wales Book of the Year Award for her memoir, The Long Field. Um, Pamela teaches creative writing at Smith College and on Lesley University's um, MFA in creative writing and she is co-director of the Dull and Thomas Summer School at the University of Wales Trinity St David's where she is also a fellow. And um, yeah, delighted that Pamela is here to speak tonight um, and she's going to talk, I hope, uh, and read from her memoir, The Long Field. Um, about her understanding of Hiraith and how, yeah, I guess, um, how a connection to a place uh, can yeah, uh, bring you more to yourself somehow. I hope that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And you're right on the mark on time-wise. And I have to say, well, thank you, Rowan. Thank you, first of all. That was really lovely. And also, that film you showed, hold, everybody hold that in your minds because we're, I'm going to conclude <laughs> my talk today with a place very, very much like that. And it's kind of mind blowing how similar that, that will be. So we're going to come full circle um, at the very end. But um, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, it's wonderful to see all of you in your little boxes or your names. Um, and I want to thank especially Rowan and Jacob and John who are working on this project. Um, oh, horrors. Did it take me off the speaker view? That's so much better. <laughs> um, and for coming up with this amazing idea um, that's investigating pilgrimage, the idea um, in words, in songs, in images. Um, it's so rich and there's so many ways to go with it. So um to Wales, to Ireland, Pembrokeshire, Wexford, um, and and way and well beyond. Pilgrimage in 
body, pilgrimage, and soul. There's so many ways uh, to look at this, and I'll I'll be doing that hopefully today. Um, and I just want to say before we start too that I've enjoyed the previous speakers in this series and thank them, um, Win James and David Greenslade, and I didn't hear Gareth Bonello, but um, I wish I had. I was away that day, but what a, a rich group you've put together. Um, so I can't sing. No singing today. I just want to tell you, you would all run screaming. Um, so I'll just be talking. And I'll tell you the plan before we start. I am going to indeed talk about um, pilgrimage, to talk about some other ideas, um, Hiraith and Kenefen. I'll be talking about doing a, a short readings um, from these two books, The Long Field and uh, Travels in an Old Tongue. In the middle, I want to stop and have a Give you, give you guys a prompt, a writing prompt, so we can all share what's on our minds. When, when I'm talking about my life, I would like to hear um, a little bit about your lives as well. So in the middle, we'll do that. I'll go back and finish up my talk and readings, and then um, we'll have a Q&A and finish. I know Rowan wants to finish off with a final song. So that's the, that's the lay of the land. Anybody have any questions? Anything to start? Everybody good? All right, we'll jump in. So as as Rowan said, um, I'm American. I am currently in Western Massachusetts. I have no Welsh ancestry, unless you believe 23 in me, which every now and then it keeps changing. They give me like 5% Welsh every now and then. Um, but I first went to Wales in 1983, um, 84, to go to graduate school um, at what was then um, university, well, it's now the University of Wales, Trinity St. David in Lampeter, um, to get an English degree, which is, I did not see the irony in this at the time, but I learned about it. Um, this is what brought me to Wales, and I will thank till the end of my days that that master's program because it brought me to Lampeter and to West Wales and from there um, to the rest of the country and that has been one of the most if not the most important thing I've done in my life um so how the question is how did that change my life and why I want to establish that before and lay this foundation before I, I get to the questions of Hiraith and, and pilgrimage um Well, I will say, let me say this. I do think we'll get to Hiraith and, and people's takes on that. But I do believe that this that the idea of Hiraith is the kernel inside almost every pilgrimage. Pilgrimages of the feet, pilgrimages of the mind, pilgrimages of the page, um, all kinds. Hiraith is what we're looking to assuage, say, by going on our pilgrimage. Um, for me to get to that point of feeling here, I, I began with Kenevan. And I'm sure most of you, some of you know that word, Kenevan. Anybody want to toss out a, a definition of Kenevan? Anybody? Your habitat. Uh, your habitat. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. A habitat and a, a very, very strong sense of place that can, stomping ground, yes, that's another good one. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, so much so that it can verge almost on the uncanny, an uncanny sense of place. Um, and this is how I begin uh, my, my book, The Long Field. Um, I'm just gonna show it to you. Here is uh, the cover of it. Um, I can also share my screen. Where is it? Why don't I see it? Oh, well. Huh, it's not coming up. Anyway, this is the book. Um, little taller, the publisher would want me to tell you, a paperback copy of this can be yours as of March. Um, so the we're going to launch the paperback in March. Um, 
when I got to Wales, I experienced this sense of Kinevan in a place I felt that this was my stomping ground, even though I had never, ever been there before. And you have to know that I grew up in New Jersey in the States, and New Jersey is the butt of a lot of jokes as the sort of ultra suburban state. It's it's um, all built up. It's their housing estates and shopping malls and cloverleaf highways and it's it's just very heavily um inhabited by us we are everywhere it's hard to see beyond us in new jersey um i had no sense of what came before me when i grew up there or of the land itself and in an inarticulate way, that really bothered me. Um, I would like dig in my mom's garden looking for artifacts from the past. It was like a tiny little archaeologist. Um, and then I got to Wales. And for the first time in my life, I walked into a, a multidimensional landscape, a place where the, the past was present. Other ideas than ours were still present. The remnants of other times, civilizations, were there. I could look and see. Now let's see, I'm going to try to share my screen, but my images aren't coming up for some reason. It doesn't really matter. The mega, I saw the megaliths. I saw tiny ruined medieval churches. All of this, these ideas from the past, these, these former times, the people who lived there, the languages they spoke were mysteries, but they were still present. And that enticed my imagination. And I also responded immediately to the land itself. Here was a place in rural West Wales in Lampeter where I could stand on a hill and see a chain of receding hilltops as far as my eye would take me. I couldn't do that in New Jersey. I could see how one hill scooped down and another hill rose up and there was a valley in between and I could see the river sculpting between those hills. I could see where the glaciers had had scooped out lakes in the break and beacons. I could see how the land rose up to, to cliffs at the coast. I couldn't see that before and until I had a sense of the human past and the deep time past of, of our planet I had no perspective on myself. Um, I thought it seemed like we were everything and that didn't feel right to me. And now here I was in a place that was telling me, no, we're not everything. Just look around you. The landscape tells you that. And that was extraordinary to me. I felt like I was seeing the key on a map in person. And that not only was extraordinary and what I had needed without knowing, it was also familiar. And that was odd that this, this place, this, this landscape that was before my eyes was a landscape I had always seen and imagined on the inside of my eyelids. It was the landscape of my, my mind for years and years. And even though I'd traveled in France and I traveled around England and Scotland, I'd never seen, I never felt this fit before until I came to West Wales. And now I experienced a shock of Kinevan. And I'll read a little bit from, from my book um, just to say how, what my take on Kinevan was. There's no way to say it. There's no other way to say it, sorry. Wales, a place I had never been before in my life, appeared deeply familiar to me when my parents dropped me off in Lampeter in 1983. The landscape made sense, I recognized it. We'd made a road trip around England and Southern Scotland on our way to Wales, and I hadn't felt this way anywhere else. So it came as a pretty big shock. Gillian Clark is the former national poet of Wales. She once told me I needed to learn the word Canavan. Gillian wrote in an email, Canavan is the word used for the way a sheep passes on to her lamb, generation after generation, the knowledge of the mountain. 
the exact part of the mountain that is hers. I understood why that would be important to the lamb, but not to me. Then Jillian continued, or it can mean that sudden sense you have that you belong to this particular place, though you may never have set foot in it before. Now I got it. Kenevan gave a name to that liminal space between the external world and the interior imagination. The first time in Lampeter that I walked past the edge of town, where the double yellow no parking lines ended and sheep pastures began, I felt myself nodding as if I were in agreement with the landscape. Its lucidity cut like a scalpel through mental images of all the other places I'd lived. <clears throat> New Jersey, Rhode Island, Washington, D.C., France. It sliced through their forests and highways and towns and cities and clutter, peeling them away down to the mental bedrock beneath, a primary place of understanding where memory and concept conjoin. And that place looked like Wales. I read that now and I still get goosebumps of, of what that felt like to experience. Um, so this was a big deal. I was 23 and I was feeling like I had come home. I felt some, uh, a, an American poet called it walking into your soul's geography. That's what happened to me. And yet I was an American kid from the suburbs. <laughs> this was not my home. I didn't belong to Wales. Um, I wasn't from there. I had no ancestry. Um, and I had to go home. I had to go back to New Jersey, home to a place that I had never felt at home and leaving this new place where I did. And even though I wouldn't learn the word for years to come, I was struck by an incredible sense of Hiraith. Hiraith for this place where I felt my imagination was, had st like struck a match and I wanted my, my curiosity and sense of wonder were called to attention and where I felt like I could be a better version of myself. Um, I had a Hiraith for those things and it would take years before I would, well, not that long before I'd get back to Wales, but Going back to Wales was just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and I want to say, just as an aside, that the title, The Long Field, um, is one uh, translation of Hiraith. Hir, Eith, long, gone. Eith as the past participle of to go in Welsh um, is the, the standard translation. But there is one that my, my friend, the, the poet Mena Elvin, found. And it's here, long, eith, a long, vast tract of land. So I remember she turned to me and said, Pam, that means long field. I thought, yes, that's the title from my book. This, the book that's all about um, me being so struck by this landscape. Um, the the book itself, The Long Field, is an exploration of, of Hiraith. Um, to me, the, the subtitle, as Rowan said, it's um, Wales and the Presence of Absence, a memoir. And Hiraith boils down to me at its very core, its white, hot, agonizing, wonderful core, an awareness of the presence of absence that there is something missing in your present moment, be it something in the past, be it something in the future, be it an aspect of yourself that is no longer present. Um, it's that big, great thing you yearn for that you may have left behind, that maybe was taken from you. Maybe that is all has always been in your imagination, but cannot bloom to life in, in reality. Um, but without this thing, you're always striving. You're always looking ahead or behind. Um, like I said, it could be a place, it could be a person, it could be yourself. Um, anybody, anybody want to toss out a hiraith that you may have on you, that you may feel what you might feel hiraith for? Um, we're going to get to this again in a, in a bit, but does, 
I can. I'm on the chair. <laughs> Hi. Sorry? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, I'm, uh, I live in Cardigan now, um, but we've only moved there uh, quite recently, uh, last few months. Um, I'm English. I'm not Welsh. Um, but when I was little, um, I first went to Pembrokeshire when I was 15 months old. And we went there twice a year, every year, every year. Um, and right from a tiny, tiny child, um, I felt here. I, I didn't know until a year or so ago what it was called. Um, but yes, very much about this, this place, which is like, it's my home. Um, I, my, my home, my home was in the Midlands, um, but I never felt at home there. Um, and when I used to leave, when I was a tiny, tiny little girl, um, we used to leave after the holiday and I'd start crying and mum and dad would go, um, it's okay, love, we've, we've booked with Gwen again, we can go and stay there um, in August or in March, whenever it was. Um, and I didn't know how to explain to them that that wasn't the point. That was, <laughs> I, and, and because we stayed in Newport um, and we stayed next to um, Karagodan, the, um, the, the uh, burial chamber, um, it's right um, in front of Carningley Mountain, Mountain of Angels. And um, she, it's almost as though she didn't want me to leave. Um, and, it, it, and, it, and it hurt, actually. Oh, I understand. Um, absolutely understand that. And, and ever since, and I've lived in, I've had a 30-year career in the northeast of England in the arts, and I've only just come back to my painting and my own work. Um, but I've, this is the place I've always had to be. And what's Thank funny you. that um, now I'm finding a different interpretation of Hiraith mm. home. Um, and that's something that's really, really interesting and, and is what my work's about at the moment. So, yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that, Anne. I really, I appreciate that. I think we all have an understanding. We all go to a place. Um, and the book, the book is about my Hiraith as a, as a person, as, as one individual, sort of wrapped around um, and woven through the Hiraith stories of Wales, uh, Trewerin, um, Epence, Abervan, um, but also a longing for language, a longing for, for grace or, or God um, through Anne Griffith's hymns. I, I take a bunch of different um, topics and talk about the, the plural and the singular, as it were. Um, and I understand that a lot of my Welsh friends, in fact, almost all of them, see Hiraith as negative, as something that um, pulls you back into the past and that you spin your wheels in the present without, oops, sorry, my computer was falling, um, without having energy to, to forge a new future. And they see it as something negative. Uh, and I understand that completely. But I think there is another side to Hiraith, which is um, a very, very creative side. Like um, I think Anne is shaking her head. She <laughs> understands. Um, where there's absence, there is longing. And where there's longing, there's often invention. And there's a space in which that invention may plant its seeds and grow. So many of the Hiraith stories give way to great bursts of, of creativity, to, um, to wonderful theories um, about that archaeologists come up with about the megaliths, um, to art, to song, to Anne Griffith's hymns. Um, so I think Hiraith isn't a singular act, I think it can can be a very positive process, a creative process. And oh, what did I say here? Not a conclusion, a prompt. And that is the end of my preamble, which leads me to pilgrimage. Because I think pilgrimage is a creative act. And I think the pilgrimages I have taken, both um, in person and on the page, um, imagined and actual are all attempts to assuage in some sense Hiraith 
that I've felt. There's been an absence and the pilgrimage has tried to help me fill that absence. So pilgrimage, I think, is intensely and inherently creative. That's what I'd like to say. Um, this awareness of a present absence in my life has led me to go to Wales something like 37 times in 40 years, which is crazy. I should just live there. Um, to attempt this weird um, linguistic pilgrimage all over the world, except for Wales. That's travels in an old tongue. That's coming up. Um, to make an actual pilgrimage in Wales, in Pembrokeshire, to St. David's. And I'll talk about that too. Um, and then to make ultimately a pilgrimage on the page, um, which led, took nine years and led to the long field. Um, so did I? Okay, I'm coming to that. Okay, we're all good. Just wanted to check to see where I am. So I'd like to talk a little bit about these pilgrimages. Here's my battered copy of Travels in an Old Tongue. It's 25 years old. It came out. Oh, I took the trip in 1995, but came out in 1997. Um, this was crazy. Uh, I tried, I took the old pond course in 1992 to try to learn Welsh. And I'm not very good with languages, um, but I'm also kind of shy when it comes to talking to people. And my, well, I would try to speak to my Welsh speaking friends in Welsh. And they'd say, Pam, you're only here for a couple of weeks a year. We have so much to say. Let's use English. We have a language in common. And they didn't want to speak to me in Welsh. Um, and it was hard to speak in Welsh in the post office with 15 people behind you waiting to buy a stamp. So I came up with this crazy idea. What if I spoke to, tried to speak to people to practice everywhere, everywhere but Wales, um, where expats in Singapore would be so happy to, to have somebody try to talk to them in Welsh that they, they take the time or in Japan, where I might share Welsh with someone who spoke Japanese and no English. And Welsh would have to become a lingua franca. It would have to be an international language. And so that idea somehow crazily turned out to be this book. Um, my partner, Marguerite, and I did this in 1995, 15 countries in five months on no money. It was intense. It was, um, it was funny. It was hard. It was, we both had breakdown at some point and just wound up sobbing. Why am I doing this terrible thing in one pair of shoes um, <laughs> with the pack on my back? Um, but it was also successful in a way. Um, I said at the the beginning of the book that I was, um, I would, I wanted to try to, to practice my Welsh, but I also wanted to put together a jigsaw puzzle of lots of expats, ideas of Wales from, seen from afar, and people who'd never been there, but were trying to speak the language, how they imagined Wales. So it was going to become this multiple creature, this jigsaw image of the Wales that we all hoped for and wanted. Um, and I, I wrote, only by traveling everywhere but Wales can I hope to find my way to Cymru and hopefully be able to, to think through Welsh enough to arrive in this other place called Cymru. Um, and that was my pilgrimage destination. And I think I succeeded more in putting together that multi-part mental image than I did in learning the language. Um, and there were all kinds of crazy adventures, wonderful adventures. Um, I remember the, the, the Grand Dame of BBC Wales correspondence told me on the Champs-Élysées in the middle of a farmer's protest and the Champs-Élysées was full of hay. She turned to me suddenly and said, Pamela, you speak baby Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> it's embarrassing for a grown person. 
Um, in uh, I had a Welsh lesson at a seaside home in outside of Tokyo in the middle of the worst typhoon to hit Japan since World War II. It was crazy, but kind of wonderful. And it led to thoughts like this. I'm going to read just a little bit from this book. Um, and then after this, we'll get on to the prompt. This is how I came um, to understand what Welsh meant to people outside of Wales. Wherever they wind up on the map, Welsh speakers, men and women, emphatically use language to assert their nationality. It's their first language, because to someone like Keith or Aleri, they're two people I met in Singapore. To lose the precedence of Welsh is to fall out of difference into the murk of the sprawling TV broadcasting, radio playing, earth size Anglo-American abyss. Marguerite, my partner who um, is Brazilian-American and, and grew up bilingual, is their polar opposite, always feeling like the different kid on the block, American in Brazil, Brazilian in the States. She uses language like a skeleton key to slip in anywhere and not be unique. I can't. I'm just American. If Marguerite is the opposite of the Singaporean Welsh, I'm the foil to the whole lot of them. The most distinctive thing about me is the, the pair of Turkish slippers I've got on my feet. Brutally uncomfortable wooden things with snazzy Aladdin-like turned up toes with pom-poms on the tip. To be American, I sometimes feel, is to be blank, without a nationality or language. Is this because America is such a polyglot culture that it contains pieces of everywhere else? Or because American culture in the late 20th century is so monolithic and transcending that it is everywhere else? Or is language the culprit? My native, and until recently only tongue, is spoken as a first or second language by one third of the Earth's population. Such universality can't help but corrode the intimate links between language and place. Sometimes I feel we English speakers are weightless and language is our wings. We circle the globe in a tailwind of convenience, but from our bird's eye viewpoints, can't tell our destinations from our points of departure. So I was seeking, clearly, was already seeking some kind of belonging. Um, and I think of this book, Travels in an Old Tongue, as my physical, literal pilgrimage. It's a young person's book, a young person's pilgrimage. Um, I was 35 when I did this. Um, after it came out, a reviewer in the Times said, all very well and good, but why? Why do you, did you do this? You know, you can say yes to speak the language, but there's got to be more to it. Um, and I thought, damn, she's right. Um, I don't really answer that question. And it took me 25 years to answer that question. Um, and that resulted in the long field. And I think of these books as pilgrimage, body, and soul. Actually, I hadn't realized that until Rowan invited me to think about this for this talk. I appreciate that. Um, so for just a minute now, before I talk about the two pilgrimages that are woven together in this book, I wanted to give everybody a prompt. Um, you can write this or you can just think about it. Maybe even just give people a little bit of time. It could just be a sentence or two. What do you have a hiraith for? This is what, what I asked earlier, but what do you have a hiraith for? Or who do you have a hiraith for? If you could take to undertake, if you could undertake a pilgrimage, that would lead you toward the place or the person or the time that you're seeking, that you feel hiraith for, what would, what would that pilgrimage look like? Where would you go? What would it be? What would you take with you? Or who would you take with you? You can answer any of those questions. 
just think about that for just a few minutes and then um we can share some we can share some responses if people want to i don't want to put anybody on the spot so just yeah take the next five minutes three four five minutes okay would anybody like to share something they've written or 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 just speak what's on your mind what you thought of yes rosemary okay hi i, I i'm just so excited by this i keep writing it rewriting but i have to say i love where i live where I live, I lived in the valley, um, not far from here before, um, and we have a, a wonderful view from our house, most amazing skies, um, I love the misty mornings, I love the cloudscapes which are ever-changing, the fantastic sunsets, and the moon which lights up the dark at night, and the views to the right of the Priscelli Hills, and the Priscelli Hills just open my heart. Um, uh, and I have such an expansive joy and, and I'm, I feel alive in even writing all of this. And the poet and the artist in me blossoms. Uh, I just, I, I, I don't know, I'm, I, I'm so excited just getting confused and reading it because it's, I just love it all. It's just, and I, I totally understand in the right and what I've written in, in the chat is that I don't find people here, the Welsh people think of her as negative. They all speak to it oh. as, yeah, very, very much, um, of the heart where we lived before um we were next to some welsh farmers and, and i know they very much felt that and our our neighbor had lived in the same house all his life and he really felt the land and, and that was his here i think the whole of this area is just my hero oh uh, that was wonderful i loved what you wrote um, i really did and thank you what i what i really loved about it was that it was so expansive and holistic you looked in all directions you experienced it seemed like you were telling us about your experience during the day and at night in all different weather and that just made me feel like this is a place that absorbs you and you absorb completely mm -hmm. that was really really well put <laughs> um, Oh, I, I, anybody else want, want to share something? I'd quite like to. Please do. Yeah. Okay. So this is something that I haven't just written, um, but something that I wrote uh, about a couple of months ago in the summer um, when we first got down here. Um, and because um, I'm a visual artist, so um, I'm a painter, um, my work has changed very much uh, since I arrived. Um, so I, I um, have been going out into the landscape and instead of trying to draw, because my work's quite abstract and uh, so it's not representational, but it's very much about the place. Um, and I started to write. Um, so there's been, and I've done quite a lot uh, since, but this is just a, a bit from one day where I'd been down for a swim uh, near Newport um, and I'd gone up to the side of the mountain, which is the other side of Carningley. And there's a stream there and it's a really, really important place for me um, because it's where um, I, we used to go every Sunday when I was little and both my mum and dad are in the stream now so it is a real going there now whenever I go it is a complete pilgrimage in a different way each time so this is what I wrote uh, moved up to the side of the mountain sitting by the bridge peace scent of gorse bracken purple heather spiky grasses Newport Bay below me, glassy water, home. Sheep bleat across the moorland, Priscelli perfection, Priscelli peace. I hear the faint trickle of the stream, mum and dad's stream below me. Soft breeze, sunbathing, the scent of my childhood. I feel my past. I remember Sunday afternoons, grey blanket, coffee, orange plastic mugs, penguin bars, dipping my toes in the crystal clear stream. I'm connected, grounded, home, balanced, still, content. A breeze returns me to the present. I see signs of the season starting to change. Rowan trees, red berries shining against the palette of various greens of the, mushroom, um, of the mountainside. A carpet of heather behind me. I head for home. Oh, that's beautiful. That is beautiful. And again, the, the same word came to me is holistic. You know that you gave us this incredible sensory 
onslaught that that absolutely anchored us in that spot it was very generous that all that allowed us to share with for you to share with us exactly where you were and what you were experiencing and then when you dip your 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 feet in the stream it's like you're reconnecting with your parents as well and place becomes people people become place and that's kind of literally true too and every time I go, I go down and I take, I just put my hands in the water and I just, I, I kind of bathe myself in the water every time. Oh, that's, that's just wonderful. Thank you guys. See, everybody has these feelings. And I think we're always on a pilgrimage. We just don't use language to call it that. Um, but we always feel here and we're always in search of ways to connect Hiraith is, is, oh, it's so important. It's when you can't quite connect, but it makes you, drives you to try. And that's the most important thing. That's the creative thing. Um, Pamela. So just to finish this up. Oh, yeah. Because, um, Ronnie had her hand raised. I don't know whether she wanted Oh, I'm so terribly sorry. I didn't see. Did Ronnie, where are you? No, there you are. I put my hand down again because because what uh, how Anne and, and Rosemary talked was just so beautiful and eloquent. I thought I'm not going to be able to. Oh come on, come on, let's hear. <laughs> well, Please just tell us. <laughs> um, well, one of the things that that I felt that you said explained about here I that, that so well is this is this drive forward that, that that contains the past. But that's not what I um, what what I wrote was was that to me for Hirath is for a world that could be and can be, um, where we're all richly connected uh, and diverse and deeply spiritual and dedicated to co-creation. And, and that's where the, the, what you've explained about the Hirath being a, a, a force that drives forward, feels that we can really take our part in the co-creation of a, of a um, of a better world, because we we contain the hereith of a past or or an imaginary world or our ancestors' world or 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 something that we're not quite sure of, but that all come together to to become instead of a a, a past thing to, that can be a future thing. Oh, that was fantastic yes yes everything you just said i don't while you were talking i don't know if you could see but people who were have their camera on were all nodding <laughs> i you brought an element that i haven't really thought of but is hugely important that hiraith is plural right it's not just us we're taking from the past or looking toward the future it's co-creative as you said mm -hmm. i think that's hugely important that's an, a wonderful aspect oh thank you for that oh i'm so glad that you spoke is there before i go on is there anybody else we have a chance too at the end where there's a q a we can talk about all kinds of things um so just to, to finish up a little bit um i wanted to say that these these last two pilgrimages i wanted to mention um, one is in Pembrokeshire, one was that I did, still is, but, um, and then the other is I did right here in this space at my desk in Massachusetts. The first one, um, was in 1999 and has anyone heard of the Via Flamanda? Oh, in hands. It's the old, it's called the Fleming's Way in English and it's the old pilgrimage route down the coast of Pembrokeshire to St. David's. Um, there's a, a brochure, and it may actually have become more than that now, a, a tour called Saints and Stones um, that links the old pilgrimage churches and some of the holy wells. And there are crosses, medieval crosses carved into hillsides um, that were manifestations of, of, of the pilgrimage on the way to St. David's. And that whole pilgrimage kicked off in, what's the date? 1120, when Pope, I think it was Calicius II, um, declared two pilgrimages to St. David's equaled one to Rome. 
So, and David's body had come to a monk in a dream and where it was. And so there was a holy relic and everybody came. It became very glamorous to do this. And there were routes all through Pembrokeshire. So I did this one route and I did it as a story for the New York Times. And on the way to get there, I was doing it as, as a travel story. I did not see it as a, as a spiritual pilgrimage. But on the way, I tried to find along another branch of these routes that goes through St. Clair's, uh, it really follows the A40, um, pilgrim's graves at Llanvahangel Abercorn. And it was a, a mention I'd found in an old book that there were these three pilgrim's graves at an, a, a ruined medieval church, and I couldn't find them. So I followed the pilgrimage route, and it was fantastic. And it became an uncanny kind of experience in that every time I was lost, I was found by someone. I tried to get in a church and it was locked, a tiny pilgrimage church. And then I would turn around and there's a woman standing behind me who is the caretaker of the church. Or I couldn't find a holy well I was looking for. And I just mentioned that to a man at an ATM machine. And he said, well, of course, I'm the caretaker of that holy well. And that happened again and again. And I thought on the way back, after I'd done this, would my luck hold? Could I go try to find the pilgrim's graves again? And I, I went back and I talked to some farmers and they said, yeah, you're looking in the wrong place. They're that way. And for some reason, I am not able to share my screen. But um, I had a picture of the pilgrim's graves to show you. You can look it up um, on Google, pilgrim's graves outside of St. Clair's. But I, I went into this clearing. I'm going to read this, this bit to you guys now. Um, and I found, where is it? Here it is. Okay. I found the graves, but more importantly, I just found the space that they were in this, at this ruined, ruined church. And this moment became incredibly important. I didn't know why. It became emblematic to me in my memory for the next 20 years that this was important. And I knew at some point I was going to have to take this journey on paper to find out why to investigate it but this is this is the scene after making my way to saint david's along the via flamanda especially with so many ha so much happy coincidental help i was inspired to seek out the medieval church of clanvahangel abracoan one more time with the farmer's directions in mind i strode into damp fields with his house and the uh, with his house and the 19th century church at my back Ahead were empty pastures connected by a strand of dark trees. After I cleared one field, a very contemporary noise, the vroom of the A40 highway, disappeared and the air seemed to take on mass. It became so heavy and moist, it seemed anchored to that place. I couldn't imagine a wind with the nerve to blow it away, and I suspected that an arm of the sea wasn't far off. I kept going across the second field, filled with impartial sheep, until I reached the trees. Some of the sheep accompanied me inside the grove, or rather I followed them, and my eyes reset to the gloom. We were on a ridge. As I suspected, the Cohen estuary flickered in the below distance, late sun bouncing off high tidal sheets of water. It looked as if gold leaf had been inlaid between the, the, the bare tree branches. A vista at once vibrant and unreal, like an exceptionally big painting by Gustav Klimt. When I drew my eyes back to the grove, I began to take in the building blocks of a scene, but couldn't quite put them together. After a second or two, I realized this was because the blocks themselves had come apart. In front of me lay the deconstructed medieval church I'd been seeking, its tumbled stones scattered across the amongst the, the trees. 
All that remained was a hybrid thing, half church, half hedge, half cultivated, half feral. Think of that image we saw this morning, uh, this morning at the beginning of this, this talk, that wonderful video. One wall stood. In its center remained a perfect Gothic arched window around which grew a profusion of tree roots as thick as human femurs, interlaced like initials in a medieval manuscript. Initials belonging to a wild alphabet I didn't know how to read. At first I thought the roots were vines, but then my eyes followed them to the top of the wall and I gasped out loud. The nearest sheep trotted a few paces off without looking up. Along the top of the, of the wall, the vines, which I now understood to be roots on a pilgrimage of their own, sprouted in a miraculous stand of young trees suspended at least 15 feet above the ground. I experienced one of those rare moments of disagreement between perception and rationality, which results for me in a feeling of falling out of myself, as if my sen senses had tilted and slid out of my brain's grasp. I'm not inventing a metaphor. I really felt like I might tip over and had to take a step or two to steady myself. I think the trees were mostly ash and they were probably there were probably about eight or 12 of them. Birds chastised me from the last one on the right. Jan Morris described similar places in Wales, different closed in places where light flows like dark water. A glade up a green lane, perhaps, a thicket behind a farm, where, she wrote, the land seems so full of echoes, illusions, and half-memories as to be almost metaphysical itself. She said that in these places where everything seems knobbly, bent, split, or complicated, you might feel you might you feel you might be intruding upon something old, strange, and confidential. This was one of those places. The exposed roots made me uncomfortable, as if I were witness something generally viewed underground by earthworms and the dead. The sight felt like a premonition, a promise, an illicit meeting, maybe. I shivered the way a dog shakes with my whole body. I wrote in my notebook, <clears throat> this is the place, meaning much more than that I found the church, but not quite sure what. So. I took that moment. I even wrote a poem about this, and I am not a poet, but it meant it meant that much to me. And I didn't understand why. And what has occurred to me <laughs> in the writing of this book is that I stumbled on the end of a pilgrimage before I knew that I was on the pilgrimage. And that's what seems so uncanny and strange and wonderful about this place that I felt before I could understand. Um, so this is what I had to say about that in the book. I felt as if I'd surprised absence in the process of becoming. There in the heavy sea air, I watched the past disappear and emerge as new life. I saw rot become grown, us become nature. I'd stumbled onto the holistic thing I'd been seeking in grad school when I used to go out walking at dusk, stopping by the edge of a field or a stand of trees and just waiting. I never knew what I was waiting for, some kind of revelation, or maybe I was simply waiting for this past, present, and irrevocable future apparent in the same space, held together and torn apart by green growing things, the insistent trees, once raised across Wales, but reasserting themselves here by taking over, by taking back, by simply living. Hiraith healed, or perhaps I was witnessing a kind of grace, or perhaps those two things are the same. Um, gosh, I read that and I'm back there and I'm experiencing this all over again. And I've just got chills running up and down my spine. Um, so this, 
this understanding on the that I came to in the pilgrimage of writing this book, the nine long years sitting here at this desk, I explained to myself why that place mattered. And I felt like that then opened up this larger understanding of the big pilgrimage of why I'd been going to Wales all this time. And I will end with this last reading um, from the Longfield. And this is going to be it. Hold on. Okay. This goes back to being on the, um, the Via Flamanda. I picked up a pilgrim's manual, St. David's, which is a little booklet, and in it read, men and women who would never have expected to become pilgrims found them, have found themselves drawn to ancient holy places and found in them not some devotional luxury, but a clarity and vision which are necessary to truly any truly human life. I'm not a religious person, but I believe in making connections, in delving, asking questions, seeking clarity from places and ourselves in ways that lay the bonds between us bare. The Pilgrim's Manual also says in Scottish Gaelic that in Scottish Gaelic, the phrase, are you going to church, translates as, are you going to the stones? It occurs to me that by going to Wales over and over and over again through the years, I've been going to the stones all along, just as my dad did with his minerals, but in my own way. I talk a lot about stone, being in love with stone um, throughout this book, and that my dad was a mineral collector. Mr. Petro, Mr. Stone in Greek, the, the mineral collector. What does it mean to be a pilgrim? The answer to that question depends, I think, on what you mean. Oh, no. What does it mean to be a pilgrim, a traveler on a journey to a holy place? The answer to that question depends, I think, on what you mean by holy place. A place of stones? More than that. For over 30 years now, Wales has been my teacher. It originally provided me with clarity of vision, a bird's eye vision that I never suspected I could find on this earth. Its discrete geography, all its individual components from clouds to valleys to mountain crags, added up before my eyes into the abstract idea of home. And its ancient habitations, the ancestral megaliths, the ruins, the place names, they eased an existential fear I'd had since childhood. I never articulated it, but it had been there since I dug up my mom's garden seeking the past of being moored alone with my temporal peers exclusively in the present. Yet the very incompleteness of the ruins, the act, the acutely absent quality of their presences, demanded I break open the crust of now and, and imagine worlds that had existed in this place before I arrived. The Welsh landscape invited me to create, but it wasn't finished. Wales humbled me next. Its language, which I've never mastered, spoke of all the tales I didn't know, of ghosts hidden in names, of myths and stories bedded into the wet green earth. I needed to learn these, along with Wales' tragedies and oppressions and post-colonial struggles. And along with them, I also learned of vividly imagined compensations, of kings and magical disappearance, disappearances and Edens on the other side of mortal time all the brilliant gifts created by, uh, generated by creative Hiraith. Above all, I learned that the most intuitive and empathetic way for me to live on this earth is to split the definitions of home, living permanently in one place, flourishing and feeling Kanavan in another, so that my imagination is permanently engaged in the long field in between. If this isn't teaching someone how to be truly human, I don't know what is. And if this isn't what home looks like, I don't know what does. I have been a pilgrim all these years. The Via Flamanda merely condensed my path into a recognizable journey with a communal beginning and with communal beginning and end points. That's just what you were saying. Folding, folding me into a shared and time-honored practice, giving it a name. 
It was a microcosm of a journey I've been on to a holy place. Home, the place where someone flourishes best. Ever since I began my master's degree in the 1980s and first heard the Song of the Stones. So that's that's it. I think I've been on a pilgrimage all my life since I've been to, well, before, even before I went to Wales, but Wales has in some way articulated it for me. Um, and I think that's it. I'll leave you with the idea that I think pilgrimage is an attempt to repair hiraith. It's the places we walk to. It's the creative work we do. And it's, I think, um, to, to reiterate what Ronnie said, um, it's best when we do it together. So um, I think that's it. That's the end of my presentation. And I hope we can have a, a Q&A now. And thank you guys for, for coming and for listening. I hugely appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pamela. That was brilliant. And um, yeah, incredibly thought provoking and also lovely to see everybody's um, response to your, your prompt as well in, in the chat and to, to those who, who shared. Um, I don't know if anybody has a, a question that they would like to, to ask um, Pamela immediately. Um, or each other. Or I... Are you going to save the chat, Rowan? I'd love to read this. Yeah, I, yeah, I will do. I will do. Okay. Um, yeah. It I mean, maybe looks I'll wonderful. Would, would it be all right? Um, oh, Lorraine's got a hand up. Lorraine, would you like to? Ask yeah, you? I just wanted yeah. to ask you, Pamela. Sorry if it sounds a little bit fruity, but um, <laughs> fruit cakey, sorry. Hardly. Um, hardly. Um, but have you ever considered the possibility that you might have lived before? People have, have brought that up to me. Um, yeah, you know, that's something that, that, that can go through my head. I don't know if I believe in it or not, uh, but I am open to all ideas and it's there. It's something that say I, that is there out just outside my perception. Maybe, maybe that's, maybe that's possible. Um, I know it's, it's an odd one because I remember when I had a B and B and, um, for a while and there was a young couple that came over from they come over from america and they'd gone to see huel vars um the museum between whitland yep and they had no link to uh, no link to uh, in their past as far as they knew they had no link to wales at all but they said they were absolutely obsessed with wales obsessed with huel dar um and they really really wanted to learn welsh and they, they and i said well why you know they said we, we don't know we don't yeah. know. We just are obsessed with it, you know, and it just seemed unusual for me. I thought, well, it's a curious, curious thing. And I mean, because I focus on Wales, I, I hear that. I, I've heard that from other people, too. But I know that it can happen anywhere. And that's a question I've gotten, too. Like, do you think you just came to Wales at the right age? That you were 23 and looking to be imprinted by some place that had a greater history than you know where I grew up. Um, I think there's more to like maybe other places would have worked, but I I spent a year in France. I was sure France was the place. Yeah. I had always wanted to go to France. I loved being in France, but France felt very much self-contained and closed to me it was self-satisfied it was i there was no foothold for me mm. I, um, I depends where you were in france in france i mean i did my degree in french and i did, ah. i lived in Fran france as well but in Brittany, it's very it's quite close to wales isn't it yes it's different i was in paris mm. but i've since been spent a lot of time in southwest france and it does feel very different it feels a, a lot more like like Wales, actually, to tell the truth. Mm. Um, but so yeah, where I was wasn't wasn't the answer. But it's an interesting idea about you thinking it. You know, tw being twenty three and impressionable, maybe yeah, it's an idea, isn't it? Um, yeah. Ash has her hand raised as well. I wonder if you want to ask a question. Hi, hi, Pamela. Um, I love your book. Thank you for writing it. And thank you for talking about it. Um, oh, thank you for saying that. 
I appreciate it. After one of the lockdowns, I'm almost still on Zoom. Um, so I have, I'm doing a PhD at the moment in um, myth and storytelling. And I oh, apologise wow. for my shoddy internet. I'm, my office is at the top. I mean, I'm a postgraduate. We get the tiny offices at the rubbish internet. Where um, are you? At Bristol University. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm as part of, uh, it's a quite a rambling question, actually. Sorry. Um, so I, I have almost like a technical question about Horizon. And um, it's linked to the, I'm doing a creative writing PhD sort of connected with it. And my my character, I'm inspired by your discussions of Horizon, she's, she's taken to um, a, a land that is sort of based on Anglesey. And the moment she's struggling with the sense of um, of wanting to leave to get back to her life, but also finding a sense of, of belonging. But because I write for teenagers, um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about whether you think her life is immediate or whether it can grow or mm. come upon you slowly, maybe when you're open to it and um, this is a girl who's gone through quite a lot of trauma and so um i'm i'm yeah <laughs> it, 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 it's an odd question i know but um no it's a good I was, question. I was wondering whether you think it's immediate or whether it can happen gently that, i think that's an excellent question and and very important for your project it seems especially if you're doing writing for young people um i apologize if the dogs has a fit the the corgi in the background <laughs> i'm sorry about that but um i think hiraith can be both but perhaps the answer is that the quality of hiraith changes and grows you know i think that maybe that you you're struck immediately by something that is res that you resonate with uh, with place with this place and it's as you then dig into it and delve and learn more, um, you become more and more attached. And the hiraith that you'll feel for this place when you're, you can't be there, or that begins to grow. And then maybe you develop a hiraith for that first moment when you felt that attachment. You know, so I think it's something like snowballing down a hill that it just gets bigger and bigger because your own memories start to get wrapped up in it um, of you, your younger self, your the quality of Hiraith you had at a certain age and goes on and on. Does that make sense? That that does, that that does make sense. Oh, I'm yeah, so pleased. Yeah, that, that, that sense of, I think also that snowballing motion is helpful, that sense of gently becoming more and more open to a sense yes. of belonging especially when you yes. haven't been open to a sense of belonging you haven't felt anything quite similar to that so as that rolls on maybe that sense of her eye you know it, it continues absolutely absolutely i think that's really important and so yeah that that um that feeling just gets larger and larger that i i i'd love to talk more about this <laughs> In fact, you know, I'm going to do. Wait, I'll my, email you. <laughs> yeah, email me. Um, I'm to put my. If anybody wants to email me, there's my email address. Um, yeah, because that's that's really interesting. I think that's something to really explore and expand upon. You can sort of poke into that in all different directions. That question. Um. um so, so I'm, it's, is it Sue or Sweet? Yeah. Do, do you want to unmute and ask a question? Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm really sorry. Uh, I've, I've not been able to be here all uh, uh, throughout the presentation, I'm afraid. And I missed a really interesting bit. Um, so apologies about that. But I'm um, just wondering, um, Hirith and Kinevin are loaded terms in Welsh, obviously. And I mean, I don't know if there's anybody here who's a, um, a first uh, language Welsh speaker. 
but I'm wondering whether, because um, I'm not in that category, although my parents are, but um, I'm just wondering whether you think a Welsh speaker might have a different interpretation of Hirai and Kenevin to, you know, what's been articulated here tonight. I don't know. What do you feel? Well, I think that's a great question. Um, and I think absolutely, I think that's the genius of these of these terms is that they're so roomy, they're so big that um, everyone is going to look at them slightly differently. Um, I think I did like when I started out working on this book, um, I read a lot. I read a lot of um, Welsh Hiraith stories. I, I asked my my Welsh friends, you know, what do you think of Hiraith? And, you know, where do you think it's it's best represented? And, oh, they people sent me, everybody sent me to How Green Is My Valley, which, yes, of course, that is a Hiraith story, but I think it's, um, I think the movie does it a disservice in some ways. Um, but, I think we're all, <sighs> Hiraith is one of those naughty things that there has been uh, enshrined in, in, in Welsh literature, a particular set of, of definitions of Hiraith. Um, and there's a wonderful article. Do, does anybody get Planet? Anybody know Planet? The, the magazine? Um, Robin Chapman, who is a, a, a Welsh linguist um, at Aberystwyth, he, he's in the Welsh department there. He wrote uh, a study of the word Hiraith in 2012. I don't know if you can find it, but, um, and he talks about Hiraith becoming sort of um, calcified in Welsh literature. It always means a certain certain dichotomies. Childhood is always better than adulthood. The country is always better than the city. Um, memory is always better than future. Um, and I understand all that. Uh, oh, the yeah, I said city, country is better than city. At the core of that, to me, it implies that the person who's feeling Hiraith is in the place that is less than, imagining the other place. And I started boiling this down to the idea of Hiraith referring to the, the presence of absence. And to me, that definition is the most, is the core for me. And that then opens out and allows everybody to define Hiraith in their own way. Um, and Canavan has many definition, definitions. It goes from the sheep, the sheep sense of the mountain to that sense of um, being hefted, landed to a particular space, a stomping ground. And then there's that aspect that Jillian Clark gave me, which is, um, you know, a sudden sense that you do feel you belong to a place you've never been before, a stumbling on the soul's geography. So I think these terms are so open and that's why they keep coming back up all the time i think that's why we keep investigating them they keep gnawing at us you know in a kind of wonderful way and it's not just what they mean but our also our emotional the emotional register that you know there we've been talking about some people feel that hiraith is negative mena elvin my poet friend all thinks that ah it it drags us back. It's that sense that we were glorious once, we will never be again, and that there's that spinning of the wheels looking backwards. But I do find that when you look at, say, someone like Iolo Morganic, there was a man with Hiraith. There was a man who couldn't accept that there was no legacy of the Druids, that that their society ended with the Roman invasion. And his Hiraith was so great that he was driven to make it up. He created this whole fantasy world of the Gorsev. And 
it wasn't true. He passed it off as if it were. But it's a fabulous, to me, example of creative hiraith, of someone who had to fill that absence. And he was driven to fill it incredibly creatively and in a way that gave Wales this wonderful pageantry for the Eisteddfod. The fact that it wasn't real, that's a sticking point for some, but it's just an example, I think, of, of me seeing Hiraith as a creative force, but other that's people. Really, yeah, that's really interesting. So did you say that you saw Hiraith as a positive absence? Yeah. That's yeah. an interesting description. Yeah, very interesting. Not always. Not always, but I just. Not always positive. <laughs> not always. You can take Hiraith in a really negative way. You know, that, um, that longing for the has been and neg or never was. Um, a certain American, former American president, who shall go nameless, um, politicized that, right? And said, vote for me. I'll take you back to this time that I feel has been and never was. Um, and, you know, you, try, you can try to legislate that mythology. And that's when you run into some really big problems. So Hiraith can be what you make of it, but I think there hasn't been, to me, enough emphasis on its creative aspect and its positive aspect and the fact that it is what inspires pilgrimage. And pilgrimage is, is a creative act, be it an artistic act or, or one that's literal on foot. Um, so yeah, all these things are linked to me. Thanks Very for that question. You guys have the best yeah. question. Mine, as we would say in Welsh, mine did the roll yawn. Oh, dear Hanwar. Dear Hanwar, how long did I do you want to? Well, well, once again, it's all moved on so much. I mean, I just love that thing of um, uh, of Yolo. Uh, <laughs> 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 it's such a good example, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. A man yeah, with because Hiraith. it's become reality. So much of what he created. Is yes. Become, yeah. Yeah. We can't do without it now. <laughs> uh, well, what I put my hand up with, with it, it, it was to, the thing of um, first language world speakers, and I just wanted to to say uh, um, briefly about my my partner. I mean, he totally lived within within Hiraith. Um ever since he he had to leave his home village at, uh, uh, as a teenager. All he ever wanted to do was to go back there. And when I met him at around 50, that's, you know, that was what he wanted. And I mean, he only lived about 10 miles away. It, and, and I just sort of felt that it's changed in all those decades, you know, but, but he, he did fulfill his, his ambition to go back there. And it was totally the right thing. It was the future as well as the past. The community was still there, even though it had, had changed and he had changed. And, and it, was just, it was just beautiful to see this, the, 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 the mixture of the Kenevin, the, the depth of his knowledge. I mean, he could, he, he, when we stood in the, in the graveyard and, uh, and, and put things on the family grave. I mean, he just brought this whole graveyard to life because he wow. knew the way that these that these people had spoken, their their in, the inflection in their voices, and it, he just knew them all. He was he was there. He was he was in his element. And when we stood on the the top of a hill, he would he named all the farms and all the people who who lived there, and that it it was just so beautiful. And he, he, he wasn't totally naive and, and, and not knowing what he was going back to. He knew all about the changes and it was still just more important than, than anything. And, and that was where he was able to go back and, 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 and end his life. It, it was just fantastic. Yeah. Who that, I think and Nevin combined. Combined. Mm. That is just lovely. I'm so glad you told us that. That idea that of of the once and future place you know that um that usually the idea is you know it was king arthur is in the is the once and future king but never the king of the present but there was a present for your partner 
And I think that when you are open to change and have that expansive view of what a place can be and how you can change too, that you can overcome that tension between past and and future Mm -hmm. um, and really inhabit the present. Mm -hmm. Um, And and that's a kind of hool. (laughs) I think throw another term out there. Inhabiting that present moment with with Mm -hmm. soaring good spirits. I love that. Mm -hmm. Can I also bring in one small other thing, and that is, I think that that, um, that living in the minor key also plays a, a part within yes. within her life. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Again, being open to that. Um, how well? How would you describe? How would you describe living in the minor key? Do I? <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, just so many of those songs that are in the minor key are just so heart wrenching. I mean, Mm -hmm. just you know, even if even if they're nothing to do with you, I mean, they just they just they just when you're pulled in two different directions, the beauty and the sorrow at the same time. You know, I think that that pulling apart and being occupying that middle ground. That's that's Mm -hmm. the bittersweet creative place yes. mm. and I think the, the the counterintuitive thing that that we that we live at the moment sort of we we strive for happiness that and the, the more that we strive for happiness the more it eludes us because because we have because homeostasis doesn't work like that so actually by tearing our hearts open with the minor key we yeah. we are open to to the creative force that Hiraith also has to come in. I think you're absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And by and being open, an act of being open, I you could say that that's the act of pilgrimage. <laughs> being open to 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 new places, to traveling backwards, to traveling forwards, to a creative pastime, a creative project. Um, I think that's. That's wonderful. That's a, a really nice note to end on. I know we've got like two minutes. Is that right? Yeah, well, I just, yeah, I wonder, I just wanted to ask something. So I think it sort of follows on from this. I'm just thinking about what you said about, um, you know, in travels in an old tongue, in a way your pilgrimage is to Cymru. So mm. Picking up on this idea of what, what is Hiraith to Welsh speaking Wales. And you end up in Patagonia that is the sort of concluding place is in yes. your journey and um i just i what really struck me um you're traveling with marguerite whose second language was spanish and you portuguese. were portuguese portuguese sorry yeah and you were um speaking in welsh but this way that you were in in a different language language identities in that place as well and the portuguese concept of so 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 dodgy so that's it yeah and um yeah that other kind of point of connection around how we translate things um but, but where the places in common are as well even in different languages that's and saudade in portuguese is so they say i mean i am not a linguist but the linguists say that's the the only exact cognate of hiraith is the hiraith and saudade but it's funny that you brought that up, Rowan, because that's something I didn't say that I was, my my pilgrimage was to Cymru and it was a linguistic pilgrimage. Could I be able to get to this imagined place through the language? And at the Argentina was the last place I traveled. And that's when my Welsh was the best. I had never spoken better Welsh up until then. I've never spoken as well since then and the great moment my triumph in this book was going to a bank in buenos aires and this was 1995 we were on the cusp of atm machines but they didn't exist yet like maybe there were one or two the internet was so new that nobody knew what email was so i couldn't really use that either um so I had to go inside the bank to get a cash advance. And I tried to speak in English to the to the teller. 
She responded in Spanish. She didn't speak any English. I didn't speak any Spanish. And I said something under my breath in Welsh. And she said, oh my God, do you speak Welsh? And I said, I do. <laughs> and I got my cash advance. <laughs> so the most kind of prosaic thing, getting money that I needed, that is what unlocked the key. And I, I felt like that I finally set foot in Cymru, that I'd been traveling in Wales, metaphorically, but I finally set foot in Cymru by accident. So it was wonderful. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I. Uh, that's been a really um, uh, amazing talk uh, as yes as i was just say that patagonia is a, a place that um uh a, a, a welsh people emigrated to um in the 1860s and um set up a a, a welsh-speaking colony and there are uh, people sp still speak welsh in patagonia today just for anyone who didn't didn't know that um so yes i i did um want to just uh, take a moment in this session as well because we've been talking about um, Hiraith as uh, as uh, the presence of absence um, and uh, I wanted to uh, remember somebody uh, tonight who will, who will be known to people in West Wales, um, a friend and a colleague who uh, died eight years ago and to, today uh, would have been her 50th birthday. Um, and she was an amazing uh, choir leader, um, but she was also a singer and uh, artist in her own right. And um, I'm going to ask Jake uh, to share uh, some of her song uh, with with you tonight and um, he's got a film to show and he's also going to say a bit about um, the work that he uh, made with her and I haven't said her name her name was Lou Laurent thank you uh, okay thanks Rowan um, I hope that this is um, audible my um, my setup is quite complicated but I believe the audio should be coming through to you so yes so Lou Lawrence was a was a close friend and colleague um, and we worked together on a project um, in around 2008 I think it was um, and I mentioned to John when we first met and started uh, working on this project that actually the the song and the name Pereira and Weave was um, was really important to me through that work. Um, it was actually a song that Lou um, kind of used as a, it, it became very important in this project. Um, so yes, so it was it was uh, it was actually a sonic art project, which um, it was called Acoustic Fingerprints. And she um, she she wrote to all the chapels along the Tyvee Valley that were within a mile of the river um, and we made journeys to each of them and she sang Pereira Nuiv in each one. Um, she also recorded silences, she was very interested in the acoustics of each space um, and I was fortunate enough to um, be able to get a bit of arts funding to uh, document the process. So uh, I'm going to share a film that was, um, it was actually the first chapel that we visited it was possibly oh not quite the most derelict um, but almost it's still there um, and it was called Capel Bryn Salem um, and it, it this is quite anomalous in the series of films and I'm gonna I've got the whole series is on Vimeo and I can put them in the link but this is the only one that actually has singing in it all of the others are video with the recorded silences in those spaces um, so I'm gonna hopefully share my screen um.
So there we are. Yes. So what you saw there was the interior of uh, Kapilbrin Salem, which is up on Chemice Head, just at the um, estuary of the Tyvee here. Um, and in the corner was a little inset of a, a time lapse of everything that took place in the building. So it was a, quite, a, a sort of layered project. I also recorded all the journeys um, to it. So it was very interesting to hear what you were saying, um, Pamela. I, I think that, that for me that Hiraith as a, as a creative act um, really made sense of that project in some ways and um, really resonated. So thank you. It was really interesting. And thank you for allowing me to share that with you. Thanks, Rowan. That was beautiful. That was so beautiful. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank, thank you. That was really, really uh, lovely, wonderful to hear, to hear that. Um, and yes, a song in, in the minor key um again um a different tune to Panet Peradin Oive as well I think a tune called Gwynllan Teen Ross so uh yeah another another sort of layer to 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 this project in a way um yeah um that I know the um our time is drawing to a close tonight I know there's a couple of things that I haven't picked up on in the chat um, just that uh, it was 11.23 that the, the pilgrimage to St. David's was instated and actually it will be its 900th anniversary next year. So there are a lot of events are planned um, around that and, and a part of the Ancient Connections project will be, will be um, connecting with that as well. Um, I just... Uh, Yes, I was reiterate that um, Pamela's book will be being brought out in paperback in March next year and is also being published in America as well. So we wish her all the best with that. Um, there are a couple of announcements um, regarding the project I'd like to, to make. Um, e E, what what are they? The announcements are so Cor Paub, which is a choir that Span host and that, which is um, based in West Wales. Um, they will be meeting again uh, to start rehearsals on the nineteenth of November, and they are going to be learning Pererin Oiv in four parts. Um, to the tune of Amazing Grace. So they're going to be singing it to that tune. So if anybody wants to join and be part of that choir, you'd be very welcome to go to those rehearsals that start. And they're, they're being held at Clinderwyn Village Hall uh, from the 19th of November. Uh, but tonight, in a way, it was our last uh, sort of the last leg of our, our Welsh journey in terms of these seminars. Um, and we're... Uh, we're about to cross the Irish Sea, um, but in a way we're crossing from Ireland and we're going to London for our next session. Um, on the 24th of November, we have Catherine Dunn, who is going, who is going to be talking about her book, uh, which is called The Irish in London and Unconsidered People, um, where she, um, yes, she's interviewed many people about their experience of um, emigrating from Ireland 
the generation really that emigrated um, during the 1950s. Um, so this book first came out in 2006, but actually was um, re published again last year um, with a with a new uh, introduction and, and more reflections. Um, I guess in the, in the post Brexit um, situation. Uh, so I please do come to that session. Um, I just want to say uh, again a big thank you, Diolchan Vaur, I Pamela. Um, I yes, I feel quite. Um, all these sessions have been surprising. I'm really, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted by how much has um, been shared tonight um, through the chat and and through people people speaking. Um, and I I know that you you you've read this line already, but this line has really struck me from your book, and I'd like to read it again. It's that here I've healed, or perhaps I was witnessing a kind of grace, or perhaps those two things are the same. And that's um, that's what I'd like to leave you with tonight. Very good. Most really enjoyable, Pamela. Really enjoyed it. I took loads uh -huh. of notes to take us forward uh, as we go through the other stages of the project and into the next bit. Really enjoyable. Really, really good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I just want to thank everybody, you know, for people just didn't come to listen. Everybody shared. And I felt like that enriched this talk so much. Um, and I felt like this was a wonderful community and Thank I you. just, just deal kind of to everybody and especially to you guys, Rowan and John and Jacob, just, you put it together. So thanks. I'm tired now. I've been thinking too hard. I'm going to have to go walk that Corgi, <laughs> clear my head. Oh, who, someone's writing. Oh, wow. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Ah, oh, great. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, it's oh, there goes the corgi. Thank you so <laughs> much, Pamela. Yeah. No, Take that, care, everyone. Thank you. Thank and you everyone. and uh, Roman, I'd love to read the chat when you're done. Yeah, no, I That's will. I will see you the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Um, well, Mr. 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 Mr.